we're just about on time now for today's session um, and I can see lots of people are still joining, which is great. So we'll um, just kick off in the next couple of minutes. Um, so welcome everyone to today's reactor session, which is on data science is more than just statistics. Um, so you're very welcome to today's workshop. Really hope you enjoy it. Um, and today we are joined by Mark Braithwaite, who is a primary instructor of Wolfram Technologies, frequently teaches classes on mathematics and programming in the Wolfram language. So we're delighted to have Mark joining us today. Um, and um, very much looking forward to the hour long session. You're more than welcome to ask any questions throughout today. There is a Q&A section which you should find um, and you can post any questions in there. We'll make sure they're all answered by the end of today's session. Just to give those of you a bit of background into reactors in case um, you're not quite aware. So reactors are local community spaces where developers and startups meet, learn and connect. So reactors do this by providing training, learning paths, industry speakers and presentations. And reactors are physical event spaces where we usually host these presentations and talks, industry speakers. Um, but as you can imagine, due to recent circumstances, we're now hosting all of these sessions online. Um, so yeah, bit of background into the reactor and um, getting back to today's session, it will be recorded and that recording will be available within about two days and I will be posting that on the Meetup event page. So if that's where you signed up to today's session um, on the reactor London, that's where I'll be posting that link um, by the end of the week. So without further ado, I will hand over to our speaker today, Mark, to get us started. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, and as already mentioned, this talk is going to be about the data science is more than just statistics. Um, it's a very interesting little talk, I think, um, and it's all based on the original um, spread of the term data science, uh, which is an amazing term um, and I absolutely love it myself. Um, it's all based on the fact that when data science became the new term that everyone was interested in and looking for, um, there was a few, I'd say quite intelligent individuals who decided to change their job title from statistician to data scientist and it worked really well for them um, for various reasons. So the main start point then is data science statistics. Well, the answer is both yes and no. Um, data science does include statistics, but it's not necessarily just limited to um, a particular field. Um, at Wolfram and across quite uh, industry, we all seem to have come up with the agreement that data science is computation with data. Um, it normally involves one of two different scenarios. The first one being that you have a load of questions that you would like answers to, in which case you go uh, locating some data that would allow you to answer those questions, and then you perform some kind of computation that then tries to provide you those answers, or whether it may be positively or negatively. The other alternative would be um, whereby your uh, you know, an individual or a company or a business that happens to have a lot of data and wishes to get further insight out of that data by doing some exploratory analysis. But in the end, both through both methods, it does come down to the idea that um, there is data involved and normally quite a bit of computation. Computation, on the other hand, doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, big and complicated. It could just be simple statistics. Um, of the descriptive kind, or in some cases, just visualizations, um, some modeling maybe. But we would like to suggest that other things may be involved with your data science, things such as image processing, um, a bit about semantics, audio analysis, and so on and so forth. There is a lot more than just the initial statistics that most people, or originally people thought of. In fact, if you try going, going doing a data science degree now, you'll find there is a, a surprisingly large number of modules that you can take your 
topic of that will help you become a budding data scientist. So one thing that computation does assist with um, on many levels is the idea that you can find things to count. Um, and I would say this is a key part of data science is making sure that you have something to count to start with because um, without some solid you know evidence to support your idea or you know completely or, or maybe not support your idea depending on you know where you're heading with that one um, computation will always help you find things to count in which case um, I have a example here from the book Lord of the Flies um, and I would like to highlight that some data science in which case the one that I'm doing here with the Lord of the Flies can simply be counting um, so to start with, we are simply counting the occurrences per page um, of the or a particular subject in this case or individual. So Jack, Ralph and the Beast. And already um, you can see from this graph um, that we have some kind of indication of whereabouts over the period of the story uh, where these key characters feature the most. Already that gives us some kind of information about the book without actually having to read it. But I find that adding things in that us as humans really do um, connect with would be something like sentiment. Which it helps if I make sure to evaluate the data first. I always like having that graph set up and forget to ever run the line of code. There we go. In which case, taking a look at the most positive sentence in that book can give us some kind of idea of if is the book generally a positive or negative uh, thing? Um, is it a nice story or is it one of you know sorrow or, or um, hardship? In which case, having a line of we are going to have fun on this island being the most positive sentence our sentiment analysis can find to me says that the center overall sentiment of the book seems to be rather negative. Obviously, it's a better suggestion to then do that kind of analysis across the entire story and just try to see if there is any. Um, I'd say evidence to my my theory there that it's quite a negative um, book and we find that by doing a sentiment analysis across the entire thing, there does seem to be some nice positive points to it. Um, so it's not entirely negative, which is a great thing to find. Um, I'm not a great one for really for sad stories. But as you can see, there are some quite negative points in the book, like at the beginning and right at the end. If you happen to have read the book um, or would like a bit more information on this one, there is a bit of a sad ending of how they get to the island and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the end, there is a kind of a recap of the story in quite a negative in quite a negative light, so it is a bit sad, unfortunately, in the way in the retelling of it. Um, but you can also see from the graph how certain characters may be related to the increasing or decreasing of the sentiment. Um, like it does seem that occurrences of Ralph do seem to be quite positive. However, occurrences of the beast seem to be seem to reduce the sense the, the positivity in the book quite a bit. And already just with some very basic counting and adding in a little tiny bit of sentiment analysis, we already have quite a bit of information about a book that most of us may not have even read. Um, in which case, that would be, you know, you're nice to do a bit of data science there. However, I don't just want to stop there. Um, I would prefer to give you a more visual example, um, mostly based on images in this case. Um, so. We did a project with a company who was doing a needleless injection system, which I'm all for. I absolutely hate needles. Um, and it was a case of normally um, they would get a patch of synthetic skin, use their system and then take a cross section and some poor guy would have to sit there in front of an image like this one on screen and count all the black dots. Um, I don't know about you guys, not the most fun you can have. Um, and mistakes can quite easily be made. Um, in fact, if you were to really take a look at some of these dots, they overlap quite heavily, um, which makes mistakes more likely. What we decided to do then was to take a look and find out if it was possible to automatically count those dots um, 
and then determine from their depth and their spread across the image, you know, get some kind of descriptive analysis going there. Um, in which case you segment the image into smaller dots, uh, clean up all those tiny little um, particles you get around them, or artifacts, sorry. In which case you get two circles, which may be overlapping. Sometimes there can be more. If you then take a look at doing a distance measurement between the two centre points of the circles, you actually can find, based on the maxima, how many circles there are in that particular image. No matter how much they are overlapped, well, as long as the two centres don't overlap, then you know, you're know you quite pretty fine there. In which case, you can get, by putting a X on every single um, black dot, kind of a more accurate count of or an automatic recognition of where all the dots are in that image. So from that, you can then start doing like how a depth measurement with the surface of the skin um, and some kind of spread measurement, which you will find if you decide to plot on a set of 3D axes as I have, um, that there does seem to be quite a spread in the depth of skin penetration of this particular system. Um, obviously, I've also done it in 3D because it was great to determine um, if there was any particular uh, density um, in terms of spread between the depth. It's harder to see on a uh, flat um, 2D image, um, but you'll find that there is even spread, you know, in all directions essentially. But already, um, just by counting simple things, whether it's words on a page or dots on an image, we really have some form of descriptive analysis of those two data sets. Um, and it can be done in a surprisingly short amount of time as well. Not only that, though, is that when you combine the simple counting with context, as I was doing in my descriptions there, um, of things such as sentiment and um, some information on what we were counting the dots for, um, you can in fact get some much better idea of what we're looking at. In which case, as I've already said with the sentiment analysis, you can have computation assist you in providing that kind of context. Um, obviously, um, I haven't yet to find a way of using computation to provide me context on what it is I'm looking at when it comes to that needleless injection system. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and most image recognition software is, it's just a load of dots on a page, which is fair enough. However, you can use computation to inject things such as geographics. So you've all probably heard of the London bike system. You know, you pick up a bike, you, you scan your card, you put your bike back in another rack, you scan your card again, it bills you for the amount of time you've used the bike for. Hopefully you guys are also aware of the API that sits behind that, that allows uh, various apps to you know, give people information on is the, late, you know, the nearest um, bike stand got bikes in it. That way, you know, you don't walk somewhere and find that it's empty. Um, but it's also used to help individuals um, and companies stock the bikes to different stands, because if they're all focused in one area, you kind of have to spread them out again if you want more people to use them. In which case accessing that API is you know, fairly straightforward and it gives you a lot of information. But sadly, um, I am yet to determine where latitude 51, 52, 91, 63 is with longitude minus 109970. To me, that's just a lot of numbers. But it obviously has quite a significance to it. In fact, if you were to start looking at plotting this on a map of London, which is the injected context, you'll find you actually get a lot more information out of what seems to be a very simple and uh, numerical data set. In which case you can, in fact, get some kind of state of the current, the current state of the system. Just by plotting those particular longitudes and latitudes on a map of London. In which case we seem to have quite a nice spread at the current moment, um, which is a nice surprise. One thing I have before the whole um, current situation with the whole COVID and whatnot, um, we did find that you, you could actually take a look at this map over the time um, at different points in the day. And you can kind of see how the bikes spread from the middle outwards during the evening rush hour. And then first thing in the morning, they'll come back in again. Um, so it's quite, you know, just by 
bit more context there, you can kind of get some idea of how the system behaves. Um, but it's all about using computation to provide you additional context, which for me is the geographics. In which case I have two other examples doing a similar thing. Uh, I'm going to use the shipwrecks one in this case, because I, I love this example. What we have available is a data set about ships. Um, they're obviously information on what the ship was, where, when and where it sunk, which from what I can tell tends to be um, just a load of points on a map like you had with the London one there. However, if you have access to more information, um, there's a lot more you can actually do with that. So first we can kind of get some idea on when the ships were sunk. Uh, again, a simple counting exercise, how many went down in a particular month, for example, in which case, surprise, surprise, they all kind of went down in the early 1940s. I'll leave you all to you know, guess why there. Um, however, what you'll find is that each ship does have a geographical point, which yes, we can just plot them on a map and you kind of can see where the density of ships kind of accumulates. However, if you then take a look at the some more additional information about those particular um, ships, each geographical location has more information to it. It's not just a single dot on a map. Um, what you'll find is because it's sea based, your sea has a particular depth at each time, at each location. In which case, by taking a look at the depth at each point, we can then kind of see how many ships would have sunk further down. So you may know that um, if you take a look at a particular ship, um, put in the geographical coordinates, in which case it will say, OK, it might have sunk at, I don't know, 15,000 feet. Well, um, in which case, you know, you now know that's going to be you know, quite a, a difficult ship to get to. However, there is a surprisingly large number that didn't really sink very far because they probably sunk just off the just outside a harbour or something. What's even better is if again you try to start pairing this with something like a 3D plot, what you can in fact get is some kind of underwater graphic which shows you kind of where the ships are um, in a more in a bit more of an interesting way I find. So here is a 3D of the ocean floor. Um, let me just make that a bit bigger. Live coding, I apologize. Hope you don't mind. In which case, this will now be a bit bigger. There we go. Um, so, we have a 3D map of the seafloor in a particular area in this case. And you can now see, because um, each of these dots will be the place or lo expected location of the ship, you can now see which ones are further down and which ones are kind of resting on these ridges. And so on and so forth. Probably quite useful if you were, you know, maybe going diving for shipwrecks. But again, it's the addition of another data set um, and a tiny little bit of extra computation that has given us some extra context on the original data set we were taking a look at. We can also use computation not just to simply count things or inject context, but we can, as we like to do. Um, try changing the viewpoint of what you're looking at. So for example, if we were to take a supersonic car, to start with, you can be given some very simple data, which simply is just the RPM of the front wheel and then the suspension load of that particular wheel. As far as I'm concerned, that's very, very little data normally um, and doesn't normally give you too much insight. It just kind of tells you, you know, if the car goes faster, um, does the suspension load change as in relation to that? And you could quite clearly see that it does. As soon as the car actually speeds up, the suspension is working as it travels over the ground. But if we were to start looking at what some of these values actually represent and say, take a look at some calculus, you can change, you can go from simply measuring the RPM of the wheel and change that to the velocity because obviously a wheel has a circumference and so on and so forth. And you know, I'll leave you guys to you know, remember all of that kind of stuff from school. In which case, we're already taking a different look. However, you can take this a step further 
in that you can start and possibly take a look at applying signal processing to what seems to be a set of scattered points. In which case, again, you can get some more information uh, from the information from the suspension. More about um, is there some kind of oscillation to the suspension itself? Because to start with, it just looks like some scattered points. But in theory, there should be some kind of oscillating signal there as the car goes over bumps and so on and so forth. What happens then if we consider taking a look at changing dimensions entirely? We have a speed and we now have a some measurement of the suspension. The signal processing changes it from um, simply the displacement to now the actual load on the wheel based on the you know, spring constant and so on. In which case we can kind of get more of a direct comparison between the two. And it's just by, we've only done this by, you know, applying some very simple physics from the original data set we gained. I don't know necessarily about you guys, but when I think data science, I don't automatically think using, you know, various areas of mathematics, such as this, you know, the area and circumference of a wheel um, and swapping between velocity and acceleration and so on and so forth. But they do give us more of an idea of um, an easier comparison between the two. So you're taking a look at it from a physics perspective in that case. Like the previous example where we've just counted things and then um, added in context and changing viewpoint, we can also use computation to add a whole new viewpoint entirely. Um, so if you think about the um, previous example we've just gone through, we have gone through something which is, you know, engineering and mechanics based. And we've kind of changed the viewpoint from a, a statistical and mathematical view to one of, you know, physics and engineering again. Whereas here we're going to completely add in a whole new viewpoint, one that might not necessarily be considered related. Um, and this is all this isn't a finance based example. So we simply have a series of assets in a portfolio and they have a correlation value to them. So if two assets are highly correlated, if one goes down in value, the other one will you know, match it to a certain degree. In which case there's various ways of visualizing these things. Um, in fact, you know, simply doing some kind of heat map across that particular set of values could be particularly useful. Um, it easy allows you, easily allows you to recognize where there are these kind of high density, well, high value, um, high values in the correlation by having, you know, a kind of striking color to tell you that. Um, sadly, though, with this particular asset portfolio, there is a lot of information in there. Um, and simply having this heat map is not necessarily um, much better than sticking with just the data itself. It does allow you to pick out the high values easier because we've got some several red values or especially in this line where they're directly correlated with themselves and so on. Um, but we feel there's still some more information that can be retrieved from this. In which case I'd like to suggest the use of community graphs. Because if you think about it, assets are related to each other in various ways and communities are related to each other in various ways, especially on social media. You're related to who you follow, who follows you or who which tweets you read and retweet and so on, depending on your choice of social media and so on. Um, so in a way, they're kind of related. Um, it's all based on. Um, yes, they are connected in some way. For us, that just means that you need some kind of correlation threshold of are they highly correlated, in which case, you know, you want to choose a high threshold. So you want stuff that is obviously um, linked based on that idea. Or you could kind of lower the threshold and just consider everything that's over a more lower value related or connected. In which case you can get quite quickly get a visualization of how related certain assets are, which I argue is easier to read. You can quite happily hover over any of these and very quickly determine which ones are related and understand that if any in this particular area were to decrease in value for any reason, you can pretty much guarantee based on your threshold that all of these will also go down. 
kind of giving you a more, as I said, easier to read interpretation of your portfolio. So, so far, as I've said, we've um, used computation simply just to count things, um, some to inject additional context, so on geographics or um, using context and um, sentiment analysis. Uh, we've used some computation just to change the viewpoint slightly, um, changing from one base viewpoint to another. And then we've gone and used an entirely new view viewpoint instead. Um, this time just a simple visualization, but can provide you an easier way of understanding what you're looking at. In this case, we're going to look at using computation to separate the signal from the noise. Because in a lot of cases, you will find that sadly your data is not as clean as it might you might want it to be. Um, in which case you might want to actually you know, remove um, some erroneous data or clean up your data to get a better idea of what's going on. In my case, I, it's also a pun. We are actually going to remove the key signal within a audio file from the noise that is present. In which case, I hope you guys can all hear this. It is simply the sound of a passing car. In which case, it is highlighted that the sound of a passing car um, does can, can give you some information on say how fast the car is going and how far the car is from the original or say person hearing it. To start with, we just want to show you a bit of a, a, a quick spectrogram of that audio so you can see how it would you know, increase in let's say volume as it comes closer. Uh, that's normally the perceptive, perceptible, the agreed perception you get is that the car gets louder the closer it comes to you. Um, what you'll also find is that it does also get deeper. Um, the audio does get um, deeper in frequency as well. In which case, if I take a look at doing a pitch recognize for that, as I'm, I'm assuming you would recommend, you would recognize, um, because audio has a pitch and a pitch and other features, in which case we get a time series. So it's how the pitch changes in relation to time. So in this case, the pitch does get deeper as it gets closer and then continues on. It's known as Doppler shift. In which case, because I'm aware that it's referred to as Doppler shift, I can take a look and find an equation for a model for that just pulled off a paper off the internet. Um, there are some things which need to be assumed, um, like for example, the speed of sound at a particular temperature. And then I can take a look at using uh, model fitting, so my computation, um, to determine a particular model where all the, whereby all the parameters fit the audio that we have available. So again, assuming the temperature is 15 degrees C, we have our speed of sound so we can produce our model and then we can then plot that. And as you can see, our model does quite accurately seem to represent our data. The great thing about using computation to determine the model is that that model has already determined the parameter for us, the parameters for us. So we can just ask it what those parameters were in which case we now have our frequency of the sound, the distance between the, in this case, the microphone and the particular car itself, a velocity, in which case we now have the speed of the vehicle, and a start time, or a time when the vehicle particularly passes the individual. In which case, I don't know about you guys, that seems to me that we've came come up with an audio speed camera. So a way of determining the speed of a car based on the sound of it passing. Could be useful. Um, further testing has highlighted though that you can't do this with electrical cars um, because they are quite quiet. <laughs> but it was an interesting idea that you could possibly have a audio based speed camera. 
the idea being that you know you wouldn't need cameras anymore you could just have a simple mic there are a lot of other it, it parameters to take a look at though when it comes to doing that kind of thing there has been one significant point all the way through though at every point we have simply seemed to just be counting things whether it's words on a page um, some kind of numeric to do with um, sentiment um, correlation again is a simple numeric but most of it does seem to just be counting so why is this data science does mostly come down to countings for two simple reasons in that more complex computations can be difficult uh, or in some cases even simple ones can get particularly difficult when you start to include significantly large amounts of data not only that the individual who's running the computations like for example me kind of needs to know what is possible with the data set you're looking at if that's not the case and you've you know you might not necessarily be an expert in signal analysis or uh, engineering and mechanics you might not think to use certain tools you might not know they exist in which case a lot of data science does come down to simply counting because that's something everyone can do and is fairly simple computationally so where am i heading with that particular point it's the fact that computer automation itself when paired with the wide variety of computation you have available should make things a lot easier um, for example if i take a look at a data set about crabs you know the lovely little creatures that scuttle around on beaches and at the bottom of water seas and so on and so forth taking a look at that data we seem to have a lot of information on color sex some kind of index um, and sizes of various different body parts as far as i'm concerned i know nothing about crabs apart from the bits i've already told you they kind of have pincers and normally six legs and crawl all over the place but by taking a look at my, this data set though we can kind of get some information on does the gender make a difference to the size of the crab you know are female crabs bigger than male ones um, if i had more information on you know were male or female ones more likely to nip for example that would be particularly useful in identifying whether the crab itself was male or female the great thing that is though i can apply machine learning right in front of you guys in fact that was so quick you probably didn't even see that i'm afraid but i can already do machine learning in front of you the automation side handles the choice of model um, and parameters and then we can quite quickly use our classifier we've just created to determine is a crab male or female based on certain sizes in this case i'm only required to provide two of the four possible five possible measurements sorry and it can already give me a suggestion of what the gender of the crab may the sex of the crab may be in which case this one seems to be male female sorry with a pretty high probability again if i knew which ones were more likely to nip whether it was male or female then being able to tell if male or females were bigger or smaller would be very helpful that way i know not to go near certain crabs and all get nipped um, would be useful for my parents my dad for example who likes to go crab fishing so we've got some interesting stories there but this might not necessarily be limited to something like crabs which not everybody is interested in um, it could be something along the lines of just simply classifying day or night images um, just simply taking a load of images and determining are they day or night um, and coming up with a classifier that can identify further images as day or night again machine learning doesn't need to be difficult or complex the automation can handle the heavy lifting and all the complexities that come with it and then you can quite happily use your day or night classifier to give you more information sadly though whilst machine learning is an amazing tool um, it's not always perfect it does come down to the person um, using it so for my for example in my case um, all my day images had lovely blue skies so clearly not from the UK um, in which case when I then provide an image from which is a, a day image with a gray sky 
it misclassifies it. And that's my bad. I was not great with my choice of images in this case. So that's not the machine learning's fault. So this then brings me on to the next idea of automation. It's brilliant at making things much easier for all of us. You know, you don't necessarily need to be an expert to get started in machine learning. It can also be used to automate the insights themselves. So, so far I've just used it to automate the process I already knew I wanted to take. Um, but in this case, I'm taking a more hands-off approach. I'm telling the system nothing about my data whatsoever. I'm just gonna give it a load of dog images. Um, so this is from the Stanford Dogs database. Um, it's three different breeds of dog, Basset Hound, Chihuahua, and Labrador, because they're just three I chose. And you'll see from some of these images, in fact, I'll try and make some of them bigger. I can't in this case. Let's see if I can zoom in briefly for you to show you guys that these images are not clean in the slightest. They have other information with them, like for example, additional dogs, their handlers or owners, um, and in some cases, even them being thrown up in the air. So normally from an image processing perspective, this is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> There's more information in there than I need. However, from, I don't know, maybe a machine learning perspective, um, you could take a look at just simply plotting them on some kind of feature space. Telling the system nothing about the data um, and just saying, look, I have these 60 dog images. Um, can you group them together for me um, in a way that makes sense? In which in this case, without any effort from myself or you know, complex use of options or anything like that, we have the dogs grouped into their various breeds simply by using a graph, a feature space plot of those images. Regardless of whether there is a pug in the image or a set of chickens. So data doesn't necessarily need to be clean, but already it has grouped those bits of data for us. Obviously this is the bit where as humans, we step in and recognize that it has grouped them as breeds. In which case I'm going to kind of want some kind of tool I can use from this. Because so far I have a graphic that I can use to gain more information myself. So I will now go ask further questions. Or I could take it a step further and create a nearest function. A method by which I can put in the image of a dog and it will tell me what the nearest image it has available is. In which case it's done a pretty good job this time. Again, not perfect. So it has quite clearly well matched certain dog breeds. However, this poor sleeping chap here has been classified as a basset hound. Done pretty well otherwise. Oh, no, this this lady or gentleman here sat on the desk has been classified as a Labrador or similar to that particular picture of a Labrador who's stood on a bed. So I can quite, I can see that one. The relation is there. So now we have a tool that's come from that automation that we may be able to put to further use. So using automation to provide us those insights directly, as opposed to having to you know, know which questions to ask. But the idea of automation doesn't end there. It can take the next step, which is the utilization of whatever it is you're doing. So this is normally deployment, in which case automation can very quickly help you on a cloud-based system to quite happily start looking at deploying things like APIs to serve web pages, or if you have the access to a private cloud, which you can put behind your own firewall, you can start using it to connect to all sorts of items that might be of interest to you. Obviously, connected to a public cloud has its uses as well, but people tend to prefer things on a more secure setup. Um, that way you can start deploying enterprise services and APIs, which you, you know, you can um, provide to customers on a expected basis. And those things don't necessarily need to be restricted to particular programming languages. At no point do we want to limit you to one thing. In which case, 
automation helps with all of this. You don't want to have to spend an inordinate amount of time making sure that your particular cloud service can work with your particular firewall and stuff like that. You want to make it as easy as possible. In which case you can take this an entire step further and start looking at, say, for example, deploying that little Lutlum borrow a bike system that I showed you earlier as a full blown application that allows you to choose a particular city and find out what their current bike system is like. Let me see if I can pick a city that might have uh, bikes in Berlin. Turns out Berlin doesn't have any very, very many cycle system, very many bike stands in its cycle system. What about Bangkok? This is where I've chosen. Yep, yeah, chosen the one place that does not have any bikes, but is on the list. Well, what about Belfast? Does it have a bike system? Oh, that one's taking a think. There you go. So I have a very simple application that you can go and deploy pretty much anywhere if you wanted. Um, for those of you who are interested, I can quite happily deploy that to a cloud space, a cloud app, uh, cloud server, and have a URL there that you guys can go use that particular app if you wanted. Um, as you guys have, you know, will be on the video, you can quite happily sit there and type that in if you wanted to, and go have a look at my app that I've just created while on doing a live talk to you guys. Even better. If you didn't want to be restricted to a particular interface that you know you've created in a, in this particular way, you could just use the kind of things as an API, which means you can connect it to pretty much anything, you know, connected small connected devices um, or existing applications. Um, I know a lot of APIs you know power mobile apps nowadays, so that would be a you know possible use for that. In which case, I didn't show you the Titanic example, but that can be quite quickly deployed as an API where you just provide a class age and sex and tell you whether or not you died or survived. You know, very simple, but very could be very effective. I'd obviously recommend that you, you know, deploy more industry relevant tools. So where are we heading with this? I've highlighted the data science isn't just statistics. It ha you know, statistics can play a absolutely brilliant part in data science, but it's not the be all and end all. There are other tools out there. So many more tools that we want, you know, want to recommend that you go looking for them. Most people are aware of machine learning and data science, sorry, machine learning and um, AI and so on and so forth. But there are others still, you know, those are the some flexible tools where you can start using signal processing or um, graph theory and so on and so forth. And um, there's a lot more than just statistics. Also tried to highlight that automation does make a lot of this possible. Um, it means that even individuals who aren't an expert can get started. Um, hopefully you guys have had some you know, attempts at doing your own data science or maybe you're trained individuals who do it every day, um, in which case I just want to highlight that the tool set is absolutely huge and you might not be aware of most of it. Um, so just highlighting that automation can make it accessible to anybody. Which then leaves me with the key point of why humans are still involved and they're still involved because they are the ones who actually have to ask the questions. Um, once you've done your initial analysis, it's always a good idea to then look at further questions to ask. You know, if I've proven that um, male crabs are always bigger than female crabs, then, you know, can I prove that they're more or more, more or less likely to pinch me? I don't know. You know, go ask more questions about the data set now that you have some kind of insight. Um, sometimes just doing visualizations can be enough. Um, but don't forget to ask the deeper questions. That brings me to the end of my particular talk. Um, if you do want to get in touch, then feel free to email me or our events team. Um, otherwise, if you have any additional questions, we now have our nice little Q&A section. So I'll go through and take a look at and see if there are any questions that come through you might want me to answer. So otherwise, thank you very much. So we'll take a look and see if, sorry. Thanks, Mark. Um, no, I was just gonna um, say a couple of comments have come through there. Um, 
that um, maybe we can get back to. Um, but one was just around um, if this will be available on YouTube, which I replied to um, and a couple of others are in there too. So yeah, we've definitely got like a few minutes left for anyone who's still with us. Um, if you do have any questions at all, um, please just pop them in there. We've lots of time to, to get back to them. So um, any questions about the session, feedback as well. I think there's a um, survey monkey link that's just been posted. Um, so feedback would be very much appreciated. Um, it shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes to fill out and the link is in the Q&A there too. Wow, another question that's come through that I really, really like. Um, fascinating applications, dog and night and day examples, particularly shows how the data can bias the results. Um, how have you taken this into consideration? Um, what you'll find is that um, in a lot of cases, um, you can take the things, as, as I showed you with the day and night example, um, you can take it into consideration by reviewing and doing a comparison between some of your test results and the data set you have to see if there are any biases that have crept in because it's a good idea to locate them first um, but then there are multiple ways of handling um, bias as a result of data um, in fact some of them are uh, about gathering more additional data and just you know continuing to try expand your data set to see if that bias has been um, introduced in maybe the way you gather the data or um, the individuals who happen to say, for example, the individuals who happen to participate in a survey. Uh, if you posted it on social media, then it might only hit certain groups. That can introduce bias, in which case, you know, gathering additional data may be useful. Um, but there are computational ways uh, that you can handle bias. Um, for example, um, if we were to do a machine learning um, example based on people's heights, um, based on and also have a record of gender, for example. Um, it may automatically assume if there's more males than females that you, you're, you're just going to be male because it's more of you. Um, you can provide computationally um, a additional layer to the decision making by saying it is equally likely these two events occur, that you're either male or female, uh, in which case uh, that can be added into the considerations the system makes um, to kind of adjust for that bias. There are other ways um, and we have a whole talk on, the, on, on that particular topic itself, so uh, I won't go into the full details now, but if you would like any more information on that one, including details, then emails on screen, please get in touch. I look forward to hearing from you. I'll just see if any other questions come through because I'm I really do love it when they do. none come through so far. Um, lots of feedback coming through, which is great um, to say thank you. Great talk. Um, so that's brilliant. I'm really glad people um, enjoyed this session. And I guess if um, there's any follow up questions, there's obviously on the screen you can contact and um, you can contact there through the email addresses or um, if you're with us on our meetup group, um, you can post any questions into the event page there and um, I can redirect to um, to Mark as well. Um, so just a question has come through there about the recording. So um, once this session is finished, um, I will be asking to get this on our YouTube channel. And once that link is available, I'll share that in our meetup page. So that's um, under the Reactor London meetup. 
um, and this particular event, that's where I'll be posting it. So for everyone who signed up um, and I'll make that available there. So that should be towards the end of the week. It will be live. And just a quick reminder, if you do want a copy of the talk, um, then yeah, head to the SurveyMonkey link, um, in which case we'll provide you a copy of the notebook, um, which you can then go through and run all the examples yourself. Um, take a look. Great, well, um, I don't see any more questions coming through. Um, so I guess um, we can end it a couple minutes early. Um, but I do want to say a massive thanks to Mark for coming on today and delivering this session. Um, and I believe it's the first time you delivered this type of session with us. So um, it's yes. great to kind of get new speakers and um, have kind of new talks as well and delivering to our community. So thank you so much for coming on today. Um, oh, we do have a new question that's just come through there, actually. Um, so that you get around to that. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. I like that one. Um, R or Python, what is it you're using for your visualizations? Um, I'm not using either, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm using the Wolfram language because um, it makes it easier for me to do my visualizations. Um, so I'd recommend if you know if you're interested in that one, take a look. Um, you'll find that it makes my coding quite simple and straightforward um, at quite a lot of areas, as you can see. You know, app deployment is simple and straightforward. It's mostly graphical, to be honest, uh, making it look pretty, but you can read it and it's nice to use. So, yeah, thank you. OK, um, if there's any more questions, please feel free to pop them through. Um, if not, we will give you back a few minutes of your morning. Um, and follow up questions can be asked too. Um, so yeah, email addresses are on the screen now or you can reach out on the meetup group as well. Um, OK, thanks so much, Mark, again. I um, really enjoyed having you on today. Hopefully have you back again soon, too. Um, thank you. And thank, thank you, you, everyone, for joining. Yeah, you're very, so welcome. <laughs> um, and thanks, everyone, for um, coming on today as well and for your feedback and questions, too. Um, and hopefully see you all at the next session. So enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully see you all soon.